Today is Trinity Sunday, in which we contemplate the nature of God revealed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One theme of Trinity Sunday is the wonder of creation. Today's readings are from the Psalms, where the wonder of creation is described. I'm reading Psalm chapter 8, and then Psalm 19, verses 1 through 10, and verse 14. This is from the New Living Translation. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them? Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims the ocean currents. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Now Psalm 19. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. It bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It rejoices like a great athlete eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and follows its course to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true, each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The word of God for the people of God. Most of you have probably learned about me that amateur astronomy is one of the hobbies that I'm pretty passionate about. I mentioned last Sunday that earlier in May, Joan and I attended the Texas Star Party, which is a gathering of about 500 amateur astronomers from around the country and even other countries, for that matter, to observe the night sky for about a week. It was really it's really kind of an odd experience the first time I went because you live the whole week like vampires. <laughs> uh, you know, everybody's up at night, sometimes all night, and sleeping during the day. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's really an interesting experience. And, and the thing I want to uh, share with you some photos uh, from that event. This is uh, me and Joan on the observing field with my telescope. Uh, one of my telescopes, I should say. This is my larger, largest one. Um, and, um, uh, and then uh, this is all of my observing uh, equipment. On the left there is my 8-inch telescope. In the middle is the big one. And on the right is my 4-inch refractor. And then you can't, even, you can't see it in this photo, but I also have a pair of 20 by 90 binoculars that I look through as well at the night sky. So I've got four different ways to view the sky, and Joan uses some of that, and then you see my eyepiece box there, and I have a little uh, tent over my table because I have a laptop computer with some stuff on it, and if it, get, it doesn't usually do that out in West Texas, but if it gets dewy, that keeps the dew off of my uh, electronics. So that's the reason why I have that. But I want to show you some other uh, photos. Um, this is uh, just a collage of the, the you know, on the top one there, you see the observing field, uh, from, kind of from a, 
that's one of the three observing fields. This is the largest one. And then you see some of the telescopes on the left there. There's one on the right that's even bigger than mine, actually. There are several that are uh, quite a number that were larger. And then there are some others there. And you can see some of them uh, are set up for astrophotography. Some of them are set up for observing uh, visually, as I do. And then I have the, the one on the bottom right. Those are all of my observing pins. Uh, you, you think we're like, uh, here you have these grown people observing these objects to earn a little observing pin, you know. And uh, that's my hat with all of my pins from the various years. We've been going to this thing for 18 years, so uh, that's where all that count comes from. But here are some photos actually taken mostly with uh, regular digital cameras, I think, of the night sky at night. Uh, that is a, a photograph of the of the Milky Way, which that's probably was taken around two two thirty three o'clock in the morning, because that's when it came up. And you see, um, uh, you know, some of the lights there, uh, and you see the Milky Way. But this one is particularly spectacular, of the Milky Way that one of my astronomy colleagues took, and you can see uh, the observing field in the bottom of the screen. That's, uh, we all use red lights at night because it doesn't ruin your night vision. Um, so that's what, a, that's what an astrono astron astronomy observing field does at night. You know, one of the things that uh, it does for me, uh, since I've been involved in this hobby now, probably a little over 20 years, um, is when I'm looking in my telescope at a galaxy that is 30 million light years away, meaning that the, the, the light that left that object that, or that is hitting my eyeball left that object 30 million years ago, all of a sudden the finance committee meeting at the church the night before doesn't seem quite so significant. You know what I mean? Kind of gives perspective um, at that point. So that's what, and, and one of the things I have um, on my... On my uh, on my telescope is I actually that one of those texts that we read this morning uh, the first the part of the first verse of Psalm 19 is actually on a brass plate on my telescope where it says the heavens declare the glory of God um, I'm pretty low-key about my not only my faith but my profession when I'm at these amateur astronomy gatherings I'm going to talk about that again in just a minute but I've known several of my colleagues that I've gotten to know over several years and I knew and I was around them some for over a period of a couple of years or more before they realized they they discovered kind of anecdotally that I was a pastor and it was almost like they had just discovered that I was a rattlesnake uh, because some of these people had never really known the pastors before and I didn't exactly fit the stereotype of what they thought a pastor would be or how a pastor would behave but anyway uh, one of the interesting aspects for me is that that the, for many in the astronomical community, certainly this is true among some professionals, although certainly not all, but also amateur uh, like me, although not all, is that many of them, however, are not believers. Uh, they, neither, they either are agnostic about the issue of the existence of God or they're atheists even, uh, those that have an affirmative conviction that there is no God. You know, the aspect that I find interesting is that for so many people around these days, both among those of us who believe in God and those who don't, we sort of take, have this understanding that science and faith are somehow or another incompatible with each other or that science is even a threat to faith. Um, but, you know, what's interesting, those, of, uh, those who ushered in the scientific age, which is, here are three of these dudes right here, um, were driven in their scientific inquiry by their faith in God. Nicholas Copernicus was a priest in the Catholic Church in Poland. Um, and he's the one who discovered, uh, or first had, came up with the idea that the earth is not the center of the universe, but rather the sun. And then Galileo was a follower, I mean, kind of a, a devotee of Copernicus, and he confirmed this, in, in he was the first one to look through a telescope at the night sky and to see the phases of the moon and the craters on the moon and the Galilean moons. We still call the four moons of Jupiter that we can see 
most easily the Galilean moons. And then, of course, Isaac Newton, who discovered the laws of gravity and, 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 and invented the type of telescope we call the Newtonian telescope, which is what mine is, my big one is, uh, he came up with that basic design, which uses a mirror instead of lenses to look through. And um, uh, these, they, were, they were all very much people of faith. And, and these kind of scientists, more than any others of their age, were awed by the grandeur of the cosmos. But what's fascinating is, about, is that how the church in earlier centuries, especially in the time of Galileo, uh, and the scientific community in later centuries would see the same new understandings of science as dangerous to faith in God, starting with the discoveries of Copernicus and Galileo. Because C Copernicus actually discovered, as you see here on, on the, on the left-hand side, that is what, the way people understood it since the time of Ptolemy, the uh, Egyptian astronomer or, or philosopher, that the earth was the center of the universe and everything. Uh, uh, and it really made a lot of sense according to what they observed at the time. But Copernicus was able to discover that, like the one on the right, is that actually uh, the earth isn't the center, but rather one planet among many that are, uh, revolve around the sun. But you know what we discovered later is that the sun isn't the center either. It's just a star and one among many. And, and not only is the night sky full of stars in our galaxy, but there are many, many more stars in our galaxy that, that we cannot see without a telescope and still more that we can't even reach even with a telescope. There are about 2 billion stars in our galaxy, and, I, and there was a news article, some of you may have seen just this past week in the mainstream media, actually, that they, the uh, astrophysicists have, are now thinking that the, our own Milky Way galaxy is even larger than what they, the, the, they used to think. Two billion stars. That's about 30 stars for, in our galaxy for every man, woman, or child on Earth. Think about that. <laughs> But even up to the early 20th century, a scientist thought that our, our galaxy was really the, all that there was, that our galaxy was the, the universe, and that the farthest objects were hundreds of thousands of light years away from us. But then in the early 20th century, Edwin Hubble, you've heard of him, right, uh, discovered that our galaxy is actually one of many galaxies, hundreds of billions of other galaxies even, each of which has billions and billions of stars. And the nearest galaxy to us is at least a couple of million light years away, and some of them, many of them are millions and even billions, tens of millions and billions of light years away. Now, this led to the common idea among scientists these days called the Copernican Principle. There are all the a shot, a Hubble deep field shot that shows where we are in that. We don't live on a special planet circling a special star in a special galaxy, and we shouldn't think of ourselves, the Copernican Principle says, as special creatures at all, that all of this is just an accident of nature that we can't be unique or significant in the cosmos. That's why in the, the medieval times in the church, they were so resistant to the new discoveries because they somehow thought it meant that, w that what the gospel, what the scripture taught about the significance of human beings is not really true, that we're just insignificant. But you know what? The author of, Psal of the Psalms had that figured out a long time ago a lot earlier. He said, when I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you would think of us? Are mere humans that you would care for us? 
Bible says the same thing the scientists are saying. We don't seem to be all that unique. Uh, we're just a, a speck in the cosmos. Not even a speck. A fraction of a speck. But then he goes on, the psalmist says, Yet you made us a little lower than God and crowned us with glory and honor and you put us in charge of everything you made. You know, although a lot of scientists think that human beings are a cosmic accident, nothing unique in the universe, just a random conglomeration of stardust, there are others, other uh, scientists and astronomers and phys- astrophysicists like Owen Gingrich who wrote this. He said, human beings with their brain capacity, their use of language, and their ability with abstract reasoning clearly represent the pinnacle of life on earth far out distancing any rivals, and to say otherwise is to engage in a sort of scholastic fantasy, he says. He quotes the same psalm, What is man that thou art mindful of him? And for thou hast made him a little lower than angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. And then he goes on to say, Yet that part, that glory, part of that glory of human creativity and self-consciousness is the ability to ask questions reaching beyond ourselves, about whether the human brain is really the most complex object in the universe or about whether we are alone in the universe, alone in either sense, whether God exists or whether extraterrestrial intelligence exists. So that's evidence, Gingrich says, that we are unique, that we are special, that we are created by God. So are we a cosmic accident or as the first part of Genesis teaches, was the universe designed for us to come to be. That's really what the, the, uh, the, you know, let me just tell you, Genesis 1 isn't about, isn't a scientific uh, description of the creation of the universe. That's not what its intent was. The intent was to show who created the universe and why he created it, which was to create human beings, that we really are, in some respects, the center of the universe in terms of God's creation. The thing that caused some of the most trouble for scientists who don't believe in any God is that they can't, that they they have trouble believing anything that they can't verify or measure or quantify. That's the new scientific of the origin of the universe, it's interesting, called the Big Bang, this notion that the entire universe had a beginning in which from, from a dense dot of pure energy the size that of the head of a pin and literally exploded in a mighty burst of energy and light. You know, that, you know what that sounds like to me? Let there be light. I believe I read that somewhere. So when we're faced with the question, what came before the beginning, science can't really get to that as much as they would like to. A few dared to ask, but most astronomers have a similar response to St. Augustine, who, when asked what God was doing before He made heaven and earth, replied, who is creating hell for people who ask questions like that? (laughs) We modern, scientifically-minded, materialistic, naturalistic folks can't stand the thought of a natural phenomenon that cannot be explained, even with unlimited time and unlimited money. And the notion that the universe had a beginning and that the laws of physics that we know and revere don't apply to what was before that, that we can't get at the forces of circumstances that caused it. That's a barrier that science can't cross. One astronomer put it this way. He wrote a book called God and the Astronomers. He said, Now we would like to pursue that inquiry farther back in time, but the barrier to further progress seems insurmountable. It's not a matter of another year, another decade of work, another measurement, another theory. At this moment, it seems as though science will never be able to raise the curtain on the mystery of creation. And then he goes on. I love this quote where he says, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak, and he pulls himself over the final rock and is greeted by a band of theologians who've been sitting up there for centuries. 
People who put their faith in science are uncomfortable with mystery. But even Albert Einstein, who, by the way, was another one of those guys who came up with a discovery that blew what everybody thought before that out of the water. Even Albert Einstein said this. He said, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger, he says, who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. The wonder and awe is one of the reasons why I love observing the wonders of the cosmos in the way that I do. The awe that the God who created all of it in dimensions that we can't even comprehend in earthly categories knows me and loves me. The Bible says that the hairs on my head are numbered and that God holds all of my tears in a bottle. The same God who created all of this. Today is Trinity Sunday when we contemplate the mystery of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. And by the way, all of those persons of the Godhead are, according to Scripture, involved in creation. When it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of God moved across the face of the waters. And then in John it says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and, and, and the Word became flesh, and that all things were created through Him. There's nothing that has been created that was not created through the Word become flesh. The sacrament of Holy Communion we receive today, we call sometimes a holy mystery. <laughs> when we take this common, ordinary stuff, bread and juice, somehow mysteriously causes us to experience the real presence of Christ, bringing healing and renewing and salvation to us. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you so much for the wonders of the cosmos and how the more that we discover as human beings through scientific inquiry, the more we discover how much that we don't know. And that the rabbit hole goes much deeper than we've been able to reach. But we're grateful, O oh God, that we, even though we celebrate the understanding that we can gain, we celebrate the fact that we live in relationship with a God who created all of this and who remains in many respects a holy mystery. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.